Welcome to the lecture series for the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. My name is Carl Dobman and I'm the Dean of the College. I'm told by our resident historian and chair of architecture, Dale Geyer, that we have not had a historian as part of our lecture series for as far back as he can remember. And we know that historians have very, very good memories. And so I believe this to be true. And so this is exciting. This is, this is maybe history making or history in progress by inviting a historian to our lecture series. Uh, and it's not easy to identify people for our lectures because we invite people that can speak on more than one topic or that are engaged in multidisciplinary types of ideas. And this is difficult for us because we've got a number of degrees within the college. We have architecture and interiors, graphic design and game design, industrial design and transportation design. And so in terms of trying to find people to come and lecture who can engage many of these topics, uh, it's exciting when we find people. Uh, and David, I would say, falls into this category. I'll talk a little bit about that. We have a number of different students joining us tonight from a range of history classes that are offered within the college. We also have students that are joining uh, tonight who will be heading to Rome over spring break as part of a travel course. And then we've also got faculty and students joining us from the College of Arts and Sciences. So welcome to everyone. So it's our treat to welcome David Carmon tonight. I met David in Rome in 2015 he was the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Postdoctoral Rome Prize recipient in Renaissance and Early Modern Studies. It's a very, very long title. Um, but at the American Academy, we shared many meals together. And I think it's always kind of funny when you get to know someone in a very casual way, having dinner over wine, those types of things. And then you learn more and more about them professionally after the fact. And I'm really intrigued by David's ability to couple history with other disciplines. Uh, and I think I, I'd say that, I think your first book, David, deals with archeology. span Your more recent book deals with the senses. And it sounds like you also have an upcoming book that deals with natural history. And so I've, I find that really interesting as a way to be able to kind of bring history um, maybe and look at it from different vantage points. Uh, David holds an undergraduate degree from Berkeley, an MRC from Yale, and his PhD is from Harvard. He's a professor and head of the architectural, architectural studies program at Holy Cross, and he's also the chief editor of the Journal of Ar the, sorry, the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians. His writings include Architecture in the Senses in the Italian Renaissance and the ruin of the eternal city. David has numerous awards and fellowships that support his writing from the NEA, Ford Foundation grant, CCA, Graham Foundation, to just name a few. Uh, and then in looking at his work in preparation for tonight, there were a couple of articles that also stood out, uh, which I think talked to this ability to bring together different aspects, um, early modern spaces and olfactory traces, on foot architecture and movement, which I think we'll be looking at as we go to Rome. Uh, and then archeology span and the anxiety of loss of facing preservation from the history of Renaissance Rome. So I had a chance to hear David lecture. We were trying to piece it together probably about a year or so ago. And we all know that we've lost track of time with the pandemic, um, but he was talking about his most recent book, Architecture and the Senses. And I was really impressed with the way that he could speak about works from a particular period that I felt like we had been taught uh, in history class, but he was able to breathe new life into them in a, in a really smart way. So I look forward to David sharing his work with all of you tonight, and I hope that we can have some good conversation and questions afterwards. So welcome, David. Welcome to the College of Architecture and Design. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl, for this really generous introduction and the invitation to speak here today. I'm delighted uh, to be here. Um, and thank you to the to LTU's College of Architecture and Design for this really warm welcome. I'm just, again, honored and delighted. Uh, so I will pull up my 
uh, let's see if I can share it here, uh, my screen. There we go. All right, and I play this thing. Tools, slide journal, I'll just play it from here. Okay, um, okay, good. So thank you again. Uh, and the title of my talk, again, uh, the varieties of architectural experience this evening, which draws upon material from the book that Carl also generously described the uh, architecture and the senses in the Italian Renaissance, the varieties of architectural experience. And that's the cover here. Um, so just to begin, I thought I would say a few words about how I came to this topic. As uh, Carl mentioned, my previous work was on the history of archaeology. And I wrote a book called The Ruin of the Eternal City, Antiquity and Preservation in Renaissance Rome, where I, where I was really looking at the political situation in the city. I was very interested in the way that politics shaped preservation and preservation issues in, the, in that moment in the 15th and the 16th centuries in particular in Rome, and how rivalries, political rivalries between the um, two different governments that were essentially in charge of the city at that time, the, the Pope as a kind of actually a temporal government in the city and also the civic government, which was a, a municipal, a set of municipal officials, how those two, basically two governments um, were rivals for power and the, the tensions between them generated new ideas about what preservation should be and how it should take place. And so for me, it was a really fun and exciting opportunity to think about, um, and I guess to rethink some of our basic assumptions about the fundamental purpose and significance of preservation itself. But as I was bringing that book to completion, I was um, actually at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. And this was very fortuitous for me because it turned out that this was a place I was working on, you know, finishing my book on uh, the history of archaeology, but there was a lot going on in terms of sensory studies. And the um, Center for, uh, Can the Canadian Center for Architecture, the CCA, had hosted, a, just recently, they hosted an exhibition called Sense of the City, an alternate approach to urbanism that had been organized by Mirko Zardini. And um, th so there was all sorts of like energy at the CCA around this topic. And then I also had the chance to meet some scholars who were who are still based in uh, in Montreal, uh, anthropologists um, uh, based at Concordia University, Constance Klassen and David Howes, who are actually founders of what's called the Cent Center for Sensory Studies. And so this was really, I thought, fascinating, this kind of world of the senses that you know was, was opening up to me there. And I was really intrigued by the, by the implications of this for my own field, um, what it meant to study the senses and how you could sort of think about history and the history of architecture through this, this lens and how maybe it might even help us to reinterpret uh, and reframe the study of Renaissance architecture and urbanism. And so I began work on this, this, this topic and as I developed it, I began to realize just how biased my own training was. I, I did go to architecture school and, and my training as an architect had really focused on the eye, on the experience of, you know, through how we interpret the world through vision. And this was not only in architecture school, but then as I went on to study the history of art and architecture, it had always prioritized visual experience. And so this has been a very revelatory work for me, or sort of uh, research project, that, um, especially in terms actually of history, thinking about the senses as a historical phenomenon, where I'm looking into this question of how and why different cultures at different times, why and how they value different and specific kinds of sensory knowledge and expertise. And so this is this book then is the result of that investigation. Let's see if I can advance my slides. There we go. Um, this evening, I'd like to start by talking, um, these are these categories I've kind of written down here, but the writing a history of architecture in the senses. And here specifically, I'd like to think about how a multi-sensory approach can help us to interpret and understand some of these 
buildings and urban settings in a new way. Then I'd like to consider a couple of case studies. And I've picked some moments from the book that I really love, that I've really enjoyed working on. Um, some buildings and sites that I've worked on and some of the issues that I've explored. The reanimating Renaissance buildings and spaces, I'd like to, in this, in this kind of section of the talk, I'd like to explore how and why our understanding of Renaissance architecture tends to emphasize motionlessness and fixity. I don't know if you found this in your course at all, and those of you who've been studying this material recently, but the, um, the way that it emphasizes a kind of static uh, interpretation of these buildings. And so I think when we begin to consider the living moving body, we realize that Renaissance architecture and urban environments, in fact, are dynamic and animated and, and exhilarating spaces that are full of movement and change. The, we'll then turn to this, you know, sort of connecting uh, to the notion of walking, which I, you know, I think very jealous to hear all you who'll be in Rome in, in uh, you know, the few weeks walking around the city, thinking about how the particular conditions that walkers might encounter in these major urban centers uh, of early modern Europe, which, you know, from London to Venice to Rome, to think about how these environments again, this movement, this experience of walking itself could inform our ways of understanding and being in the world and how that's shaped by, of course, the physical environment, by the built environment that we inhabit. And then finally, this last category, the choreography of an olfactory landscape, where I am going to be looking at some evidence from Varallo, which is a pilgrimage shrine in Northern Italy. And that's this view that we're looking at here. It's actually the a kind of reproduction of what's called the Scala Santa, which is the sacred stair um, that takes you, you know, up to uh, the, um, this, this sacred space that you know, is being commemorated here uh, that, that Christ uh, climbed. Um, and so the reconstruction of this kind of Christian world, this world from the Old Testament, or the New Testament, I'm sorry, that's being, um, that's being recreated in this pilgrimage shrine in Northern Italy. And I wanna talk about that in relationship to evidence from the Jewish ghetto at Venice. And so to think about how we can see um, the special significance of the sense of smell for, of the, actually, yes, the sense of smell, right? Olfactory landscape. So smelling and how smell mattered to people who visited these sites and who lived in these sites in the early modern period. And again, I think smell has been a very interesting sort of um, facet of the built environment. For me, I found it fascinating to explore this, uh, given that it's perhaps the most misunderstood if not most maligned of all the senses in terms of the kind of Western hierarchy of the senses. I think this investigation can show us how Renaissance culture was in fact very attuned to smell as a means to focus the attention and to strengthen memory, right? The memory of certain um, moments and certain places. So the book that I found very uh, a kind of provocative and valuable resource for my kind of launching this project, and which I think many of you probably are acquainted with, um, this little and very beautifully written manifesto by the Finnish architect and critic, Juhani Palasma. Um, this was a very transformative experience for me to read this book. Um, and I think it's a very common text by now in design programs. And I really like the cover. This is the first edition that you're looking at here, which I think points to so many of the ideas that this um, writer was is, is addressing. Um, Caravaggio's famous uh, painting, right? This, this picture that shows us St. Thomas, who does not believe or who actually right, doesn't even understand um, the significance of Christ's sacrifice and, and uh, unable to understand what it means until he's actually physically pressed his finger into the wound. And uh, so this being Palasma's idea, thinking about how, how we can challenge our reliance on sight and emphasizing the importance of other sensory ways of knowing, and I really love this 
picture in a sense, like everyone is looking down at that finger that's pressed it, but it's almost as if they're blind, they are un unable to see, and it's really the sense of touch that transmits that information. And this idea of the significance of touch that's highlighted also in the choice of title that uh, Palasma used this kind of curious title, the eyes of the skin, which is related to neurological research that he cites that suggests that skin receptors, human sort of skin uh, itself is capable of perceiving color and light. And that in essence, at some level, we can even really perceive visually somehow through our skin that he's not only challenging then our preoccupation with the eyes, eyesight, but sort of underscoring how all of our senses ultimately are, are, are linked and really ultimately deriving from this sense of touch, this most intimate and proximate of all of our senses, one that really depends upon our being within the range of the body. So, of, of course, for centuries, the Western hierarchy of the senses has privileged the distant senses, rather, over the proximate senses. So sight and sound, which are sound, you know, we can perceive across great distance, um, as opposed to taste, smell, and touch. Uh, and this is the kind of Aristotelian idea of these five classical senses. Um, but in addition to this, the um, scientists have also identified various other kinds of senses, such as pain, heat, and cold, uh, proprioception, and kinesthesia. These last senses are related to uh, the body in terms of its a sense of balance uh, and the sense of movement, kinesthesia. And so one of Palasma's key arguments is that our obsession with sight, what he calls ocular centrism, has had a debilitating impact upon all fields of cultural production, as he says here, and architecture in particular. And Ledoux's image, which we're looking at, highlights how we are really accustomed to perceiving architecture first and foremost through the sense of sight, through the eye. And at the same time, as Palasma writes, this is this distancing sense, the sense of sight, that seems to weaken our capacity for empathy, compassion, and participation in the world. The artist Herbert Bayer draws our attention to the way that our senses, in fact, overlap in our lived experience. And here we see how the experience of sight and touch could potentially be mutually informing, reciprocal. The, another surrealist work by René Magritte reminds us of the fundamental power of these, what are often considered subordinate senses, the proximate senses, such as in uh, this image where we see a moment of heightened emotional and psychological intensity, that it's in fact in such a moment as this that our proximate senses take the lead. Uh, for example, we close our eyes when we kiss. And so thinking about these other senses in addition to sight, um, I, I, in terms of thinking about my own field, the kind of key figure is uh, Leon Battista Alberti. And this figure plays a role in Palasma's book as well to explain the enduring obsession with the eye in the field of architecture. Palasma turns to this figure, to the Renaissance architectural theorist, Leon Battista Alberti. And we know Alberti's fascination with the mechanics of vision. And this is attested in his various treatises, especially in on painting, where he, his study of optics and the operation of the human eye provides the foundation for his discussion of linear perspective. The term perspective is in fact a synonym for optics deriving from perspicere. And this means to see with clarity, to examine, to see through. And so Alberti's preoccupation with vision has had a powerful and lasting impact upon the way we think about architecture. And Palasma writes, oops, sorry, excuse me. Um, he writes that 
Western architectural theory since Leon Battista Alberti has been primarily engaged with questions of visual perception, harmony, and proportion. And this is a plaquette with Alberti's self-portrait on the left and a commemorative medal that's on you see on the right. Both of the images include Alberti's personal insignia, which is this strange, almost surreal, in some way surrealist uh, image as a disembodied winged eye um, that underscores the celebration of the visual sense. The advent of linear perspective as a hallmark of Renaissance art rested upon the technical in innovations introduced by Alberti and before him Brunelleschi that were calculated to create a convincing illusion of a three-dimensional space on a flat surface. And here we have Durer's uh, depiction of a draftsman who's using an artificial grid to create a steeply foreshortened view of his female model that shows how the construction of the perspectival viewing system imposes a barrier that separates the viewer on the one side from the object on the other, the object that's being viewed. This image highlights the way that the technology of perspective transforms or has the potential to transform our relationship with the world. It's an artificial window onto the world. And I mean, it's kind of ironic that we're speaking through Zoom like this, this artificial window that we're framed by here that separates us, right? That keeps us from, uh, that prevents us in a way from, from interacting in a more embodied way. Um, we're no longer immersed within a changing environment. Instead, instead, we're set outside of it, remade into a kind of static, motionless observer who examines the world dispassionately and at a distance. And yet while Renaissance thinkers developed these technologies to acquire a better understanding of the complex nature of vision, my argument is, is that this doesn't mean that they were not attentive to other sensory modes of understanding. We've really concentrated upon the, the visual modes of understanding the world, but that's not the only thing that they were interested in. Um, I think that historians really have focused more, you know, we've really exclusively focused upon the visual modes of understanding, especially for the, the way that we talk about Renaissance architecture and urbanism. And it seems to me that because of this, we failed to grasp many aspects, uh, many rich multi-sensory aspects of this building tradition. All of the senses contribute to our experience and understanding of the built environment. And I argue we need to consider how Renaissance buildings and urban environments were conceived not just to engage the eye, but instead how they created a kaleidoscope of multi-sensory experiences that really engaged the entire body. So to come back briefly to this building, which I uh, talk about in the chapter uh, in my book called, called Movement in the Built Environment. And this is also the building that's on the cover of my book. Probably, uh, I imagine everyone here recognizes this as a very famous image. It's the canonical view of the Tempietto, which is probably the most famous Renaissance building of all time. And the image is taken from the cover of Architecture in Italy from 1500 to 1600 by Wolfgang Lotz and um, the authoritative kind of survey of this you know, 16th century Italian architecture. And this building has traditionally been placed at the center of Western architectural history. And of course, many of us have probably had to memorize this building for slide exams and that kind of thing. But, you know, so we know it in some way, but at the same time, when we think about our other senses, when we, especially, and I was really fascinated by kinesthesia, that the way that the body and movement shapes our understanding of buildings, we begin to realize that this is a very reductive image, that it's in some ways it's even very misleading in terms of how we actually interact with and experience this building. We see here another more uh, a contemporary view of the building on the left with uh, the famous elevation by Sebastiano Serlio on uh, the right. Um, this kind of imagery, I argue, these kinds of views, which of course I think are very familiar, the, the perspectival view on the left, and then this um, kind of combination, strange drawing, but it's an elevation plus kind of a section on the right, how in effect these drawings, these images have tended to fix this architecture in one position, which seems to immobilize it. And this 
then has led to a whole way of talking about this architecture, which I don't know. Again, I'm wondering if this is something that's happening still in courses that are happening at LQ, I'll have to ask Dale, but um, I think everyone will recognize this kind of comparison where we have the Tempietto on the left and then the Borromini's building, right? San Carlino, the um, San Carlo alle Quattro, Quattro Fontane on the right. And so this is a way of teaching architecture that has a long history. Uh, it, it recalls the uh, system that was introduced by a scholar named Heinrich Wolfling, who's paired sets of images. He paired these images that helped us to def define a way of understanding his building, like the approach to uh, mo the modern discipline in some ways of art history. And based on these kinds of comparisons, Wolfling concluded that the psychic responses created by Renaissance architecture on one side versus Baroque architecture on the other, that they were diametrically opposed, where the Renaissance structure with its perfect circular form uh, created what he called a static calm of being. And the Baroque buildings, right, with these wonderful animated plans, um, ev evoked what he called the unrest of change and the tension of transience. And so these have been very powerful ways of thinking about these buildings. This is really, I don't think it's that surprising that we still use these distinctions today to talk about these buildings. We still associate Renaissance architecture with a kind of static calm of being as opposed to these dynamic and animated buildings of the Baroque. But um, it's important to realize that the Renaissance buildings, right, just like the Baroque buildings, it's a very particular point of view that we're looking from. Um, you can notice here in these images, the, uh, the photograph of the Tempietto is actually a very carefully structured single point perspectival view that is highlighted when we look at a, uh, uh, this picture by Raphael on the right, um, that you know this corresponding perfectly to Raphael's depiction of an ideal centralized temple, where even we see the placement of the vanishing point within the central doorway. And so this idealized, perfected uh, perspectival view that's, that's being structured in this kind of photography. Whereas experience tells us something very different. And if we can construct this ideal when we visit these places, when we very carefully position ourselves on, in this privileged position on axis, as soon as we move, and of course we always do, right? To get to this point, to leave from this point, I mean, it's actually the Tempietto, that view is almost impossible to get. It's like, I think they had to rig up a special camera to get that photo. Um, as soon as you move away from that position, the illusion disintegrates. And so it's worth noting that Bramante, who in, as the designer of the Tempietto was also, I think it's very clear, he was very interested in ways that the moving body experiences this illusion of perspectival depth. And so this is the um, church that he designed previously in Milan. When we enter this, this space, the San, Santa Maria Presso San Satiro in Milan, Bramante's ingenious perspectival fiction creates the impression of a centralized plan. And you can see this is the, um, the view that we're looking at on the right is the view taken from the center of the nave looking down towards the crossing. And in the plan, you can see that the building itself is in fact not uh, uh, a kind of Greek cross, right? That it, the, the, the apse at the end doesn't exist because there's a road that runs right by, by there, but he creates this illusion, right? Of a kind of a perfectly um, symmetrical uh, axial arrangement around a, a central crossing, that this is something that I think shows us how Bramante wanted us to experience these places in movement. Clearly, Bramante didn't intend for us to remain anchored right at the entrance where we would have this idealized view, this static, motionless view. Instead, obviously, you advance into the space, you advance into the nave, and as you move, the illusion collapses. And so you see in this detail the carefully constructed stucco um, patterning, this detail, a kind of amazing work uh, to create this optical illusion applied to the rear wall. Uh, and it's precisely the movement through the space, the body's movement through the space that is the source of this strange, and I think it's very special, right? This, this kind of discovery of what this is, right? This, this pleasure that we experience uh, 
when we come into these spaces, right? This illusion that dissolves, that disintegrates. And that's part of the, I think, design, the original design's kind of goal. These kinds of physical environments thus choreograph complex sensory experiences. And this lived embodied interaction with the space imprints lasting memories. And these are not, I don't think they're very easily forgotten. They're really, they are embedded in us because of this lived embodied experience. And this leads me to a kind of my own uh, interaction with some of these spaces. This sequence is, this is a sequence of images that recalls or kind of is intended to capture something of my own personal memories of a sensory encounter with the Tempietto. This is my son and we're climbing up the hill of the geniculum. This is towards the American Academy where Carl and I would have these wonderful meals. And this was a very hot day and the heat was radiating off the pavement. And so we arrived at the Tempietto and it was um, a moment, right, where it was very clear um, that to stand in the kind of conventional spot in front of the Tempietto in this blazing sunlight was extremely uncomfortable. And so we really spent most of our time off of our, off this kind of primary axis in the shade. And you can see my son is venturing out to join me in the sun here, but, um, Afterwards, I could I like you know did everything to try to persuade them to, you know, to to experience the building with me, even though they kind of were reluctant at first. Eventually, they they got into it, and so the um, they're climbing around the building, and you could see the stone was actually very hot to the touch. My daughter is kind of her hand is recoiling from the surface, and they're coming down this um, set of stairs at the back of the building that goes towards the crypt, where in fact, of course, it's much cooler below. And the movement throughout this space, circling the colonnade, moving between light, between shadow, the, um, the temperature changes that that meant, the, uh, the, 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 the textures, the surfaces that they touched, the, the granite columns that feel dry and coarse when they're in the sun and yet curiously smooth and cold in the shade, this kind of very dramatic contrasts. Um, these images that I used in this book were in part of my goal, I actually, you know, incorporating this material, and I hope to talk more with you about this at the end, but the, um, to challenge our use of the canonical frontal and really immobilized view of the Tempietto that has been used to represent this building, that there is a much more dramatic and I think engaging variety of multi-sensory experiences that we can record or with, that we can think about, right? When we're, when we're um, considering these structures. So the, the, this category about walking, um, walking in the early modern city, this, this comes from another section of the book. Um, and I've been working, as Carl said, I've had some uh, other sort of studies that have thought and focused on walking and movement. And this, this was really a, um, a section called On Foot in Renaissance Rome. And in this section, I explore how movement can also help us to rethink the way people experienced and continue to experience not just buildings, but also the city. Uh, today, we might take the paved surface of the city street for granted, but this wasn't the case in the early modern world. And London in particular was notorious for its mud. There's lots of, you know, I think it's just amazing what you can begin to cover when you start study these, um, these, these sources. There's um, someone writing in 1583, Philip Stubbs, who says he got very angry about a, a new fashion in shoe design that was called the pantofle. It's a kind of a slipper that has this extended heel. And so apparently, you know, these like dandies or, you know, English uh, gentlemen were wearing them and, you know, around in the street in London in the mud. And he says it was completely impractical Slipping and slapping up and down in the dirt, they exaggerate a mountain of mire. So this, you know, kind of idea of this very physical interaction with the, the street itself, right, that like creates mud and actually gets all over you. Traffic that made matters worse. In 1599, Thomas Platter, another uh, visitor to Rome, declared, the city of London is so populous, one simply cannot walk along the streets for the crowd. And even as late as 1736, another uh, writer, Robert Phillips, described London's streets as a labyrinth of mountainous ruts, making it, as he said, so dangerous and so difficult to go out of a track 
that carriages can hardly pass by one another without a returning. And that's what we're seeing in this image here um, with this kind of you know, chaos that's happened here, the you know, being upset in this, the city of London. Uh, we can begin to understand why early modern pedestrians had a heightened sensitivity regarding the ways that they touched the ground. The very different kinds of surfaces that they chanced upon could shape their experience and understanding of these environments in profound and very unexpected ways. And so in contrast, right, thinking about that example of London, um, in Venice, there was a very different urban sort of um, encounter, a kind of encounter with the, the ground that the Venetians manifested a very precocious interest in extending uniformed paved surfaces throughout their city. The Piazza San Marco, which is of course the central square, um, was paved with brick as early as 1268, so in the second half of the 13th century. And this was actually still, many of the other squares in the city were still um, grassy fields at that time. And so to think the word campi, which comes from that, or the campo, which is a field, is a relic from that, you know, these kind of fields that were open in the center of the city that then eventually became paved. And it's likely that the compactness and dampness of the Venetian archipelago encouraged the adoption of pavement as a civic necessity. For centuries, the foreigners, right, you can imagine someone coming, especially from London, but other cities as well, who were accustomed to wading through mud, they had reason to rejoice, right, when they alighted in the spotless streets of Venice. At the beginning of the 15th century, um, Peru Tafur, who is coming to Venice from, I think, from Spain, exclaims, the city is as clean for walking in as a gracious chamber, so well paved and bricked is it. No beast on four legs can enter it, and in winter there is no water in the streets. There is therefore no mud, and in summer, no dust. And so you can see there is, in fact, water in the streets, especially, right, the Aqua Alta does periodically flood the city of Venice, but, you know, when he was there, it was this ideal moment. Um, and he certainly was very appreciative of the absence of dust. And in the late 17th century, an English visitor, Edmund Warcup, reported Venice had, Venice had these dainty, smooth, neat streets whereon you may walk in most days in silk stockings and satin slippers without soiling your feet. So few other cities provided this kind of condition, right? This kind of um, opportunity for you to walk in this way. And so the um, this was also in no small part due to the fact that there was an almost complete absence of wheeled traffic in the city. The absence of these large and dangerous wheeled vehicles, and of course the animals that produced dung that pulled them, made the city much safer and cleaner for those who went on foot. So these particular pedestrian conditions in turn can help us to understand the enduring Venetian enthusiasm for one of the most extreme inventions in the history of European footwear. And this is the, this platform shoe, this towering stacked shoe known as a Chopin. An elevated shoe that articulated a very specific relationship with the world. The Chopin, which was unlike its more prosaic ancestor, the clog, the Chopin aspired to a more celestial status, right? More elevated. Um, and this is, we have captured in a really wonderful way in this line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. By your lady, your, by your lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a Chopin, right? So like carrying these figures aloft. Um, and so even with the absence of wheeled traffic, the innumerable canals, bridges, and stairs of Venice, you can imagine, posed challenges to the Chopin wearer. Already in the 15th century, there was in fact legislation issued in Venice that sought to impose a mandatory height limit on the Chopin, arguing that pregnant women who fell while they were wearing these shoes risked the lives of their unborn children. So that they were trying to control this you know, fashion because it was, uh, in fact, uh, it could be mortal. Uh, had mortal consequences. The 300 years later, the English traveler 
Thomas Coria reported that he saw a woman fall, a very dangerous fall, as she was going down the stairs of one of the little stony bridges with her high chopin, alone by herself, but I did not pity her because she wore such frivolous and ridiculous instruments, which were the occasion of her fall. So we see this lady, this was this kind of image that you could flip open and show her, expose her Chopin below, right? You could see this out, you know, kind of strange costume that the Venetian women wore. Um, and yet if Coria derided the, the foolish Venetian lady who risked her life for fashion, he may have been ignoring other possible motives. And this I really found interesting. Of all the women in Renaissance Italy, it was Venetian women who were the subjects of the most um, obsessive restrictions of gender. Patrician women were segregated from society and their only authorized public appearance was the short distance that they made they could travel between their homes and the parish church. For these women, the Chopin then provided a unique opportunity to assert themselves in the world from which they were otherwise so vigilantly excluded. Raised high above uh, on these towering heels that slowed their movements to a crawl, escorted by a retinue of servants and wrapped in these exquisite fabrics that were made even the more dramatic and showy because they were so long, right? The cascading down all the way to the ground. These women transformed their ordinary devotional routine into a competitive ritual into a parade that exalted their otherwise invisible presence in the city. For the Chopin could draw attention to the very act of walking itself. And this, I, I'm paraphrasing the work of the anthropologist Tim Ingold, who says that the Chopin, and this is his term, the Chopin shaped a very special kind of pedestrian touch. By lifting the body high up into the air, the Chopin wearer had to sense the ground from a distance. Through the intermediary of this very tall vertical column, in Venice, they were usually made out of cork so that they made it a little easier to move, right? The lighter um, uh, weight of the, of the cork heel. The most daring Venetian Chopin lifted the body up onto its toes by sloping the shoe upward toward the heel, sort of like a high-heeled shoe, but up on stilts, basically. And this required even greater coordination. According to Baldassare Castiglione, it was precisely the precariousness of this walking, right? The, the Chopin wearer who's like balancing on these stilts that enhanced her movements where her deliberate and careful steps gave grandissima grazia, this greatest grace, to her posture and to her gait. Launching the body to an unaccustomed center of gravity, the negotiation of urban space while walking in this way required patience and skill. The Chopin not only defamiliarized the body's movements, but also def defamiliarized its surroundings, obliging the Chopin wearer not only to relearn her physical carriage, but to rethink her relationship to the environment. Every micro movement mattered. She had to rethink her bodily habits to achieve a new position of equilibrium in the world. And so this was a, you know, an opportunity to think about how we interact with our environments and how these uh, these prosthetics, right? Something like a shoe can change the way that we perceive our environments. To look at Rome, um, to think about how walking for, was of course the primary mode by which pilgrims experienced the city for centuries. And here, this image that shows us pilgrims who are arriving in Rome for the first Jubilee of 1300. And the institution of this practice of the Jubilee of this celebration and its ongoing recurrence in later years um, meant that pilgrims of all kinds from every part of Christendom converged upon Rome to obtain a plenary indulgence. And so this, I love this image because it shows the pilgrims coming from both directions, kind of coming into the city, uh, marching towards their destination equipped with these marching staffs as they, and the walking staffs as they, as they come towards Rome from down the mountain. The, Jubilee itinerary included the four major basilicas of St. Paul, St. Peter's, uh, I'm sorry, St. Peter's, which is, of course, down in the foreground there, the, um, the primary destination, of course, but then St. Paul, which you see in the upper right, uh, the Lateran in the uh, middle here, the San Giovanni, and then Santa Maria Maggiore, which is over here um, on the left. So those are the, um, these basilicas that were part of the itinerary that all of these pilgrims would visit. And this is a late 16th century view that shows you 
this orderly and continuous column of pilgrims that's marching, basically traveling on foot between these different basilicas. You can see them kind of merging together these strands uh, of these, these pedestrians. Um, all but St. Peter's of these, of these basilicas, they all stood in what was called the disabitato, which was the uninhabited area outside the medieval core that surrounded St. Peter's and the Borgo. So the early modern popes had been trying to improve access to pilgrimage sites around the city, but nonetheless, Rome at this time really was a landscape of ruins, and that meant that the pilgrims faced significant obstacles as they moved around the city. And so this made me think about how walking through ruins as the physical negotiation of an environment that offers us strange and unexpected conditions may compel walkers to make complex and unaccustomed bodily movements. On the left, you see the famous uh, Shadow Panorama of Rome, which shows the city as a continuous and undul kind of uh, undulating ruinous landscape juxtaposed in the bottom right there by uh, uh, a photograph by uh, Roman Vishniak of Berlin in the immediate aftermath of World War II, which highlights the unfixed and unstable nature of ruins. As the scholar Tim Edensor observes, traveling by foot through a derelict site offers a diversity of distinct experiences which defamiliarize, again, the encounter between the feet and the world. For example, ruins rarely allow a walker to move along the shortest route between two points. Instead, walking through ruins resembles walking through a labyrinth. The route is ambiguous and arbitrary and open to multiple options. Ruin walkers must make different kinds of movements from those facilitated by more normative urban spaces. They adopt improvised poses. They must balance themselves carefully when they descend the slippery slope. They have to duck under obstacles. The irregular topography affects the rhythm of one's movements as well. You may have short steps that follow long ones, and you may have to pause and turn and stop and retreat at any point. So I think the idea that ruins bring the body into close contact with the ground and force us to slow down, how this is a very particular way of moving that the Renaissance Rome generated and created as this environment for, for pilgrims to, um, to experience and, and uh, maneuver their way through. This is a detail from the Bufalini map of 1551. It's the first orthogonal city map of Rome since antiquity, and it shows the, the leg of the pilgrim itinerary these pilgrims when they were traveling around the city of Rome. This is the section that linked the Lateran, which is down here at the bottom right, with the uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, which is over here on the bottom left. So those are those two basilicas. And so the pilgrims would have to travel between them. Uh, this was the section of the pilgrimage itinerary that was the furthest from the, the, the Vatican. And it was also one of the most difficult routes that these pilgrims confronted when they were in the city. It was full of hills and valleys and also honeycombed with ancient ruins. So through the reconstruction of the route that they took, the route that connected these two basilicas during the Renaissance, I think we can get a better sense of the variety of movements pilgrims had to make as they moved between these two sites. The pilgrims departed the latter, and you can see this is the first section of their journey, that descending this, what is kind of a steep ridge that is the southernmost spur of the Esquiline that crosses through the ruins of an aqueduct, the Aqua Marcia, which is this kind of zipper thing that you can see on the edge of the image. Um, they went through the aqueduct uh, and followed the track down to the valley below. The, at the bottom, they, near this church um, of San Pietro and Marcellino, they had to cross this bigger road, which actually led up to the Porta Maggiore. So they, you know, this is an intersection that they turn uh, and they, uh, they go up at this point um, on the other side of the valley to climb up the central spur of the Esquiline Hill. So all of this is part of the Esquiline, but you can see that there's a valley in the middle. Uh, at the top, they come into this clearing, which is crowded with all sorts of antiquities. And you can see there was an aqueduct that ended here. Um, the Nymphaeum of Alexander, that was the big fountain at the end and the Trophée Marii which is the Monumenta Mari, this, all, all these sculptures and ancient objects and remains that are clustered up here at the top. This 
At this point, they had to turn, take a sharp left, um, and they pass under this kind of, through this little stretch, the Arch of Gallienus, there's kind of a narrow passageway, and then they have to take another right, uh, up a kind of dog leg, and then another left, right, to get to Santa Maria Maggiore, the piazza. So there's a kind of zigzagging and up and down and through these ruins and under arches and over um, structures, a difficult pedestrian route that was a fundamental part of the pilgrim's experience. And yet this was completely erased during the Jubilee of 1575, when the Pope Gregory XIII, Bon Compagni, opened a new road, the Via Merulana, this broad boulevard, to create an unbroken axis that linked the two basilicas in a level, straight line. These urban interventions by Gregory, as well as his successor, his very famous successor, Sixtus V, are very well known. They opened these popes, these new roadways across the uh, urban landscape, and they placed those Egyptian land, uh, obelisks at either end, right, uh, to make it easier um, as a kind of marking, right, visual markers at the end points. You can see the obelisk in this image up above. Um, the, the early modern popes were very interested in making it easier for pilgrims to walk between these different basilicas, and the Via Merulana, of course, eliminated the hazards that pilgrims had previously en encountered on the route. The substitution of a more uniform and homogenous built environment transformed, though, the, the, the pilgrims' physical movements. This is what I think is interesting to think about. Instead of wandering right through this irregular maze of ruins, now they walked at this regular and unvarying pace on a level, smoothly paved surface. And so how different that is, right? This kind of radical transformation in terms of how you move through the city that takes place in 16th century Rome. The irregular surfaces of ancient Rome for all of their challenges had provided a kind of lively sensory stimulation. As early modern pilgrims trekked across the city, the ruined landscape drew vivid attention to the act of walking itself as a bodily movement so habitual and so pedestrian that it usually escapes our conscious thought in contrast, the new Via Merulana enabled pilgrims to walk from one basilica to the other in a straight line, a kind of linear movement which we might think of as an analogy to even thinking straight, staying focused on the task at hand. And this may have supported the papal agenda by eliminating the vagaries of ruin walking, the new Via Merulana directed the pilgrims to concentrate physically and mentally on their devotional practice. So the last kind of section of the book that I wanted to touch on um, is this chapter uh, from the, the building of devotion. This is um, the Sacramonte at Varallo, uh, which is the first, what was the Sacramonte literally means holy mount, uh, a kind of pilgrimage shrine that was founded by the Franciscans in the Alps, the Italian Alps in the late 15th century. And this is a print that shows the complex that you know, really attached to, you know, on this outcropping, this kind of uh, uh, a, a ridge that extends down into the valley, um, a, a site that was created to facilitate devotion for pilgrims who were unable to travel to the Holy Land. And this, the idea here was to create a place that enabled these pilgrims to witness scripture and scriptural events in the flesh, in person. And so, in this chapter, I was looking at the kind of complex multi-sensory experiences of the site, but I wanted to focus in particular on the sense of smell, as this I felt was really a key sense that we, um, we need to think about more in terms of our, how we understand architecture. And yet, really, I don't know. I mean, I feel like architects only maybe recently are beginning to think more about it. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. Um, certainly, it seems to be more or less less attended, attended to in the scholarship. For the Franciscans, the idea of staging multi, a multi-sensory experience, I think that this was a fundamental driver in the creation of this site. And it's interesting to think about St. Francis himself, who was uh, the creator of the nativity scene. This um, the idea, right, for the Franciscans was to create an opportunity for us to inhabit these spaces with our bodies. And that this was a 
part of their didactic goal, sort of purpose, right? They, um, according to this memorable phrase by Gaston Bachelard, who wrote the Poetics of Space, a whole vanished universe is preserved by an odor. And I think that the Franciscans were conscious of this. I think they knew they had this, an understanding of this, an appreciation of this idea that the sense of smell functions as a kind of experiential trigger. And by choreo choreographing, um, choreographing, sorry, these multi-sensory olfactory experiences, the Franciscans could, or I think they hoped at least to imprint memories, specific kinds of memories upon the minds and also the bodies of the pilgrims who visited these sites. This is a view that I think um, was in the poster today that um, delighted to see. It's a, it's a typical view at Varallo. And these are these chapels, these different chapels that are set out across the hillside um, and with these views into a distant valley below, below, below with this river that flows through it. Um, the pilgrims who visited these sites were moving constantly in and out of these chapels, back and forth between these interior spaces and exterior spaces. And so this was making me think about, you know, this pattern of in entering buildings and leaving them and kind of repeatedly this movement back and forth. Our reactions to smell are most visceral at the moment when we first encounter these smells. And so this particular arrangement of buildings had, I think, a very special olfactory significance. This design, this, special, this particular arrangement of, of little pavilions um, constantly reawakened the visitor's sense of smell, the pilgrims' right sense of smell was constantly being stimulated against as they came into these new environments. Each of these chapels contained these elaborate dioramas or tableaux that depicted stories from the life of Christ. And after climbing all the way up the mountain, the pilgrims would travel in sequence, right, from one chapel to the next. And so this is at the very beginning of the itinerary. You can see they're numbered, right? So you, like the pilgrims could keep track of where they were. The, at the very beginning of the itinerary, this is the Bethlehem complex. So trying to reproduce, reconstruct Bethlehem. So you could actually just visit it in Northern Italy. You didn't have to travel to the, you know, to the, to the Levant, to, the, to Jerusalem. You could do it all right there um, inside. This is the Annunciation scene where the angel appears to uh, the Virgin Mary. And above these scenes, the Franciscan mounted these passages from scripture, these relevant passages. So they would cite both the New Testament and the Old Testament um, to kind of show how they one anticipated the other on each chapel. And this would be reference material for these friars who would be explaining these scenes to these audiences. And so you can imagine many of them were illiterate. And so part of this, again, thinking about all these different senses that are involved, which is very different from our experience today, um, but how auditory experience would have been important at this site, where voice, the voice, right, of this Franciscan who's speaking, intoning these words, would have framed the encounter with these scenes. In this original layout, the um, Sacramonte at Varallo encouraged pilgrims, so the way it was originally intended to be designed, we, can reconstruct from the sources. Pilgrims were expected to have an active, direct, and intimate encounter with these tableaux that were staged in, in each chapel. St. Francis is credited again with the invention of the first living nativity scene, and the Franciscans were known for their sacred plays. There are narratives from the Franciscans from the 13th century that invited the faithful who were cont contemplating these kinds of scenes or scenes such as the nativity to embrace and interact with the sculpture. They were intended, there's this is a passage, right? And this is for the nativity scene, kiss the beautiful little feet of the infant Jesus who lies in the manger. Pick him up, hold him in your arms, reverently kiss and delight in him. This is a kind of interactive tradition. And it encouraged the faithful to place themselves into the scene as if they were actors participating in a drama. Early modern pilgrims were expected to step into the action of the scene itself. And so dissolving the boundaries that separated the visitor from the tableau, met a this, in this way, the Franciscans transformed the spiritual, the scriptural narrative from an intellectual one, right, from just the sounds of these words into a lived bodily experience 
through intimate contact with these objects, with these material things, using not only the distant senses of sight and sound, but especially the proximate senses of smell and taste and touch, the Franciscans created this unique and unforgettable lived understanding of the story, right? This story of um, the central story of uh, the Christian narrative for their audiences. And finally, at the end of this route, the, they would the culminate, right, at the, the, the movement through these various um, chapels ended at the, the sepulcher, the chapel of the sepulcher is the culminating scene. And this is the entrance to this chapel with this inscription that commemorated the friar um, who named Francesco, or I'm sorry, Bernardino Caimi. And you can see this is the, um, the inscription down below, which is in that, it's, an, it's a section from the uh, inscription that you see over the door. And it says, right, conceived that he conceived of the sacred places of this mountain so that those who could not make the pilgrimage could see, videat, Jerusalem right here, right, so that you would be able to encounter it in person. And yet, even though they emphasize seeing in that, uh, in that passage, we know that Varallo offered much more than just this visual experience. There's this, at the entrance to the sepulcher, you, you have to have kind of you can enter in through this um, by going under this lintel, by this um, this low doorway, which is just as in Jerusalem, which is what the inscription says. You can see it in the background here. This is that um, block of stone, and so you're kind of forced to go down, um, as you see these pilgrims are doing at Jerusalem itself. And we know from contemporary accounts that visiting the sepulchre in Jerusalem, um, which was a confined architectural setting and that was lit artificially with inadequate ventilation that it was in fact a very unpleasant olfactory experience and this is what we have in this passage that is cited here um, you can see the uh, a, a visitor uh, making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the late 15th century writes this cave has no window nor is there any light in it save what comes from 19 lamps which burn in it from and these lamps hang above the sepulcher and inasmuch as the cave is small, the fire of the lamps makes a smoke and stench which greatly troubles those who enter the place and remain therein. A, a smoke and a stench that greatly troubled visitors. I think this was really powerful in terms of thinking about how the Franciscans sought to recreate not just the physical site itself, but even these kinds of sensory experiences, this olfactory experience, to make this traumatic event all the more present and memorable for the pilgrim. In such a setting, the stench of smoke and soot could evoke the choking grief of the faithful as they confronted the dead body of Christ prior to the resurrection. So thinking about all of these um, these questions about, as I, as I was writing the book, I was thinking about how our employment of the various senses and also how our understanding of the senses continually changes across time and space. And so Varallo again provides this useful case study to, to reconstruct a kind of sensory shift that we can see happening during the 16th century when um, grills, sorry, let me see if I did this right, right there, um, grills, partitions, um, partition walls, fitted with these kinds of grills, you can see on the upper left there, uh, and kneelers as well, those kind of that um, bench across the bottom. These walls were installed to prevent visitors from entering into these architectural spaces, right? They actually physically barred them off. Um, the grills were created to direct your sight line and to provide this ascension point of entry into the scene. The kneelers, and again, again, right, using architecture to press the body into particular forms, uh, into particular positions that uh, making you kneel down as you looked into this space, a kind of reverent position. These interventions that took place uh, in this reconstruction of Varallo also, I thought it was very curious how it would have shifted attention away from the sense of smell. They the remodeling of this of Varallo suggests how, at this moment, the Franciscans decided to prioritize distance sensory modes, such as sight and sound, over the proximate sensory modes of touch and smell and taste, trying to narrow the um, 
trying to focus, I'm sorry, the pilgrim's attention on approved devotional forms, right? So it's thinking about this view that you get, right, which guides you towards this particular part of the diorama of the, of the tableau, right, to focus our attention. In, in doing this, though, this really meant the Franciscans focused on a narrower spectrum of sensory experience. And so finally, right, after having gone through what you can imagine would have been kind of a grueling itinerary, uh, pilgrim, the pilgrim to Varallo would have ended his or her journey at this central piazza, um, where they would sit in the shade. Uh, and we actually have uh, records that describe these tall pine trees that actually had a very particular smell that was, you can imagine, very pleasant and kind of refreshing. Um, and drink, again, a kind of refreshment water from the fountain, a kind of sense of taste and smell and touch. Um, how that then was an opportunity to reflect upon these multi-sensory encounters and experiences that they had gone through. This kind of attention to sensory experience, which framed the, um, the, the, the pilgrimage to Varallo was something that I wanted to juxtapose then with the way that architecture also shaped the sensory experience of the Jews um, as the largest non-Christian population in early modern Italy. Uh, in 1516, Venice was the first city in Italy to establish a Jewish ghetto. And so you see in this uh, detail from uh, 17th century map, the ghetto as a kind of enclosed city within the city. And these architectural and sensory boundaries that were created in this way, how they enabled people, um, including Jews and Christians, to identify this community right away and smell in particular, that olfaction figured prominently in this landscape. For example, there were specific smells in the ghetto that resulted from the Jewish dietary restrictions prohibiting the mixing of milk and meat. And these, you know, on uh, familiar smells to the, to the Christian audience would have mixed with other very particular and distinctive smells, such as coffee, which was drunk by Jewish scholars who studied late at night uh, and used coffee to stay awake. This was also, there was a kind of a very strong underlying stink caused by overcrowding and the presence of detritus and excrement that pervaded this part of the city. Um, and so to think about the blending of these different kinds of olfactory experiences from the most pleasant to the most offensive, how this might have signaled something, how it meant something, how it signaled for, to the Venetian Christian would have signaled difference, an alien perhaps, right? As opposed to those who lived there, to the residents of the ghetto for whom these smells could be interpreted in sort of in sense of belonging. I was curious to think about synagogues in the book. I looked at these examples um, and thinking about how synagogue interiors could be very elaborate Right, this, this is this really sumptuous interior of the Scuola Grande Tedesca. But at the same time, the outside, the exterior of the synagogue was often indistinguishable from its surroundings. And this was intended to protect it from attack. And it's curious to see how Christian map makers often reinforced this invisibility by erasing the ghetto from official representations of Venice. So maps didn't always show the ghetto itself. Um, and so to think about the role of visibility and how that didn't matter as much maybe to the Jewish population or they, they weren't privileged, right? They didn't have access to, the, to vision in the same way. Um, to think about other senses, the, the acoustic experience, the, the significance of these spaces in terms of sound, we know that oral recitation was a central part of Jewish ceremony and they had sermons and readings from the Torah, musical performances and cantillation which is a kind of chanting. And this is what one scholar has described as creating an active humming effect. So the sound of this, right, would have marked it off as different and very immediately, right, that the sounds produced in the ghetto different from sounds that you would encounter in other parts of the city. But finally, uh, and to conclude, thinking about smell 
again, the Jewish practices, um, religious practices that involved smell. We know from Michel de Montaigne, who had attended the circumcision ceremony in the ghetto in the late 16th century in 1580, um, who observed the ritual use of an incense burner, and he described it as a round object riddled with holes, held first to the nose of the minister, then the child, then the godfather, they believe sense fortify and clear the mind, making it more suitable for devotion. And so I was struck by this, thinking about smells in these very different worlds that really in some ways didn't connect at all, but in other ways really did. Um, like the Franciscans at Varallo, the Jews uh, in the ghetto at Venice coordinated spatial conditions and sensory experiences. And were interested especially in smell as a way to make the mind more suited to devotion. Through the deliberate staging of these multi-sensory environments, Christians and Jews sought to claim both the minds and the hearts of the faithful. And so to end, uh, I just wanted to touch on some of the questions that this book has raised for me that I am still thinking about. Uh, and I'd be delighted to you know, discuss further with with you in the question and answer session, but just thinking about the way that the study of sensory experience and multi-sensory experience holds value, I think, for the study of architecture and for the you know, um, built environment in general. I think it makes sense for us to think about this, this subtitle that I've used in my book, The Varieties of Architectural Experience, and the title of the talk today, which is really echoing the work of, um, of the early of the psychologist, the early 20th century psychologist, William James, who wrote a book called, a very famous book called The Varieties of Religious Experience. As James emphasized, he, he was really interested in the multiplicity of religious experiences, that each of us has a very different relationship to the way we understand religion, the way that we inter, interact with the religion, the way that we live religion, um, and was interested in kind of documenting that and trying to acknowledge that religion is not kind of monolithic thing. I think it's the same idea, right, for the way that we think about architecture. It's, I think it's really urgent, actually, that our field recognizes and emphasizes these very different experiences uh, that these kinds of environments can create. And this has had an important impact, especially on the material that I study for um, thinking about for more than a century, we've relied upon a really visual account to tell the history of Renaissance architecture, but I think we can do more, right? I think it's a little bit inadequate to just talk about vision um, and the way that we see these things, uh, that clearly these were environments that, that did offer a kind of experiential trigger that intended to stimulate their, their visitors to, to, to interact with these, uh, these environments in, very, in a kind of changing kaleidoscope, right, of, of uh, a kind of immersive experience. And finally, the, um, the question about, I think a kind of question, a complicated question that I'm still sort of struggling with, how we in, you know, thinking about these environments um, can integrate ourselves into them, right? That we, and myself as a kind of thinking of myself as a scholar that I acknowledging my own presence in my scholarship. Uh, and this is what you see in these images with these pictures of my own kids and my own personal experiences that I, I incorporated into this historical narrative. So thinking about those things is perhaps intention. Um, I mean, the experience of these sites is part of, the way that we understand them. And, uh, and yet, especially I think academics have a hard time acknowledging our subjective positions, the way that we interpret um, things in, in our own experience and how we integrate that into our work. And so, you know, thinking about how that, those two things come together here of our own personal lived experience and the way that we, what we present as uh, objective knowledge. Um, and kind of, the study of the built environment. So my book was intended to be a kind of challenge to this idea of, you know, kind of the, uh, the entrenched idea of a kind of objectivity in historical studies. And I'm still thinking about what this means for ne my next project and how this will affect my work going forward. But thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, David. That, that's amazing. To talk. <laughs> I also know how difficult it is when you're used to lecturing to 
lecture when everybody's cameras are off and and all of those things too. So um, maybe now it'll be a little more interactive. But I, I think it's fascinating. We'll we'll open it up to questions. But I I like the way that you ended as well, just talking about the varieties of things and even. Dale and I were talking today just about the role of education, right? And, and we often feel like we have to simplify things in order to make it clear. And, and what's, what's really interesting about your lecture is just like the way that you talk about maybe the almost like the stories that we had been told about the Renaissance, right? Simplifying them down so that we could learn that. We were talking about the even the compression of curriculum, right? Like that, hmm. that most architects have a, just a couple of history classes. And, and how that gets simplified. And then the way that your work is just opening that up and that there's actually much more richness and much more diversity there than maybe we've been, we've been told. I mean, I appreciate that. That's really, uh, you know, wonderful of you to say. I, I, uh, I mean, that's what I hope to try to be kind of sketching out in a way is that the, um, these are, and to sort of, to point to the, um, to the value of those narratives on the one hand, right? That we do need narratives that are kind of, uh, that are manageable, that we can kind of digest and hold and, and retain and that allow us to talk about these, you know, to kind of put these otherwise kind of incoherent, right? Sort of objects into some sort of a, a, a coherent narrative. Um, and yet to also be sensitive to the ways that those narratives ultimately do simplify and uh, ask us to kind of, um, you know, they, they in their in their very nature are uh, are are forced are kind of directing us to concentrate on certain aspects and maybe neglecting others, which you know also deserve to be another kind of narrative. And so these multiple narratives, which uh, I think make it again sort of infinitely fascinating. That was the um, you know that was sort of the departure point with this looking at this work of William James, the psychologist who was talking, you know, making this observation that religious experience isn't just one way of, of thinking, right? That everyone, each of us, right, has our own way. And so it's really, you know, architecture seems like that too, right? We, each of us has a kind of very, even if obviously there are points of overlap, um, so many different ways of interacting. And I was also reminded too that uh, we have our students from interiors from an environmental psychology class joining us tonight too, uh, which seems That's incredibly great. relevant. Oh my gosh, environmental so, psychology. Yes. <laughs> so I think for Q&A, we could just, if anyone has a question, uh, you can unmute your camera and unmute your microphone and we'd love for you to be able to ask a question. I would love that. That would be because in general, I do, my classes are, more interactive, it's true. And so I, I you know, I, I hope that this, you know, wasn't just like too much stuff that I was droning on and on about, but uh, it's great to kind of get feedback and hear what people's thoughts are and any questions you might have. I have a question. I've been told that I can ask Anything in Italian as well? Sure. <laughs> Can I? Because I'm Italian, so I wanted to use this opportunity to say grazie mille per la lezione. <laughs> <laughs> uh, io provo a chiederlo in italiano, poi in caso okay. non te lo dice lei. E ho trovato straordinario il concetto del, del collasso, dell'illusione. Mm. E, e volevo capire meglio questo aspetto del, del rinascimento sul fatto che eh, c'è questa mh, intenzione di raggiungere la perfezione. Allora volevo capire dal suo punto di vista se questa ricerca dell'illusione poi è una contraddizione rispetto ai mm. diciamo del rinascimento oppure un modo per affrontarlo ancora di più nel senso che a tutti i costi dobbiamo cercare la perfezione anche a, a costo di forzarla e di creare illusione. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, so, molto, molto interessante, sì, la, la, um, I will try to translate the, um, the, the question about, and you can correct me if, I'm, you know, if I get it wrong, but the idea that the, um, the, this, the question about the illusionism that we saw with the Bramante, where we were looking at the, um, uh, the, the San Satiro and thinking about those, and that is so much part of the Renaissance um, 
approach to design in some ways, right? Is thinking about this uh, intended to be a kind of rationalized perspectival uh, in, uh, environment, right? This, this, the world that is rendered in this kind of um, lucid uh, and, and, uh, and actually measurable uh, uh, way that perspective, right? Scientific perspective, which is what Alberti was uh, was offering in his treatise. That's you know that's that's this fascinating and exciting uh, kind of technology, which can then be right sort of it's in dialogue with the world. And so thinking about how the world itself can be structured in ways that then creates that kind of uh, that perspectival uh, you know that opportunity to exercise those kind of perspectival. Uh, skills in a way, right? To, to see the world in that way and to, to create a world which has those kinds of uh, characteristics that perspective encourages. Um, and But then how that, and so the question, right, was to think about how that is also uh, in tension with this collapse, right? The, the idea of, of it being ultimately a fiction, right? That it's not a kind of, uh, you know, this 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 ideal viewpoint that these pers perspectival places or environments right presume um and you know i think everybody's seen the famous image of brunelleschi standing in front of the duomo and he's trying to you know using the perspectival right sort of technology to to capture to see exactly right the the way that the perspective can be captured on this two-dimensional surface he can actually render it the three-dimensional illusion uh on a on a two-dimensional surface i mean it's this fascinating uh, sort of again technology, um, but that it's the I guess the what I found so interesting about this. I mean, I agree with you. I think it's very curious that we have those. It does seem to be a very strange tension because there's a, a desire to create this perfected in world, and yet a kind of also recognition that it's in some ways impossible. Right? It doesn't. It doesn't. It is a kind of a, a an illusion that's only. If it's ever achieved, it's only temporary. It's fleeting, um, and so the it, I find it very poignant in a way because it seems like there's a you know this this attempt to create this ideal uh, environment that can be uh, can be perceived in this way that is this kind of limpid and lucid world. Um, uh, that is, but that is, you know, the, the, the fact that as soon as we, um, the fact that we move, right, the fact that our bodies, I mean, that's the, the issue. And just even to go back to that image of the Durer, where it was showing the artist with his, you know, his, he's looking through that grill. Remember, he's like sitting in front of this, of the, of the woman who's, you know, kind of this steep perspective, this foreshortening, and he's holding his body, right, with that kind of um, this, this kind of needle that's in front of his eye, that's holding his eye fixed in one place. And what you can only imagine would have been a very painful position, right? To hold your body so still, right? To kind of maintain this, so to maintain this illusion because he wants to try to, you know, capture, you know, and to document, right? Moving back and forth between the grill that he's seeing in front of him and on the page. Uh, and his face has to, his head has to actually be, motionless and it has to be exactly at the same height um, in order to 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 for that perfect uh sort of trans trans transfer to take place um and so how it's how the artif artifice of it is so kind of much part of it right there's a kind of this recognition that it's artifice uh at the same time as it being also possible right that there's a possibility of achieving it but it's also an artifice and artificial and it's and i think part of the way that i be, was thinking about it is that it's um when we begin to think about the moving body right that the body itself is never i mean even if you're trying to hold so still right you're always moving the body is always these micro movements that it's just you know the living body cannot be frozen and so how those motionless spaces which we fix on a two-dimensional surface um, and that architecture can right, be composed in those kinds of perfected axial ways. Um, a design like Bramante's, which 
is a fiction, like obviously a fiction. I think it was part of the pleasure, right? Part of the wonder of it was the, that it's both and, right? It's not just one. It's like the, the fact that it's this, um, it's, it's a, um, a perfected space and it's also clearly, uh, you know, something that will, it's only from one particular point works without, before, it all falls apart, right? It's, soon, it's, and it's that kind of wonderful tension going back and forth where you can move into that position, but then it collapses and move out again and coming back and forth, um, which seems to me um, shows us something of the, uh, you know, I think of it as, as dynamic, right? A kind of dynamism in Renaissance architecture rather than a fixity, because I think traditionally we've kind of just talked only about that privileged ideal viewpoint. But, you know, I mean, of course, that is the viewpoint that it seems like these buildings, you know, they do seem to privilege. But at the same time, when we're, I mean, that's of one tiny moment. Uh, and these buildings are obviously meant to be encountered in so many other ways. So it's a kind of a, I find it a very lyrical relationship where the, you know, moving through space really changes the way we think about these, um, you know, otherwise kind of idealized and static environments. I don't know if that was yeah, that's giusto, andavo <laughs> meno centrato. Perfetto. I really love the way you talk about the tension then between fiction and reality, because I think, I believe it tells the whole story. So like we talked about simplification versus like, uh, like the, the whole narrative. So that, mm. that, that was great. So oh, thank you, sure. thank you. Yeah, no, I think the, um, I, I, I do think that there's a kind of a, um, I mean, I just, again, it goes back to that comparison of the two with the, you know, the San Carlino and you have the Tempieto and you have this like building that's so obviously dynamic and animated and movemented. And uh, I mean, it's just so obvious, right? I mean, the, this frozen building compared to this like very lively one, you know, but architecture is never frozen. I mean, it's never, it's, you know, I think that's what's so interesting when we think about how we, you know, inhabit these spaces that it's, um, it's, and it also raises a really interesting question about the use of photography, right, in architecture, which is so important, right, that we use these images to understand these buildings and to study them and to analyze them and to make sense of them, that we can really, you know, review buildings using images in a way that, um, Perhaps we, it's you know it's it's not always possible when we visit them on on the site. But this you know this also it was really interesting to think about as a as probably in some ways a kind of a um, a, a challenge to the to the person who becomes so familiar with these buildings through images that then when we go to the site we're kind of looking for the image right we aren't really looking for that building anymore. We're kind of looking for that one view. And I remember that with the Tempieto where I was trying so hard to find that one position, which is, you know, like you have to stand on a stool and you have to be sort of like hovering in the middle. You know, it's like, it's very awkward. And so, and you kind of lose the whole experience of the building because you're trying to reconstruct this, uh, this particular view. And so how that, you know, that's a, that seems like a kind of, it's fascinating to think about how architectural photography uh, structures our understanding of these environments and has shaped a kind of way, you know, our expectations of what the building should be doing, which is, you know, not always comprehensive. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't always completely do it justice. No, it's, it's, that's a really interesting point in the way that representation, we, we use representation as a, as a way, as almost a rhetoric to, to explain what we're doing, but then the way that that changes, right? Or the way that like a one point perspective versus now scanning a building and having a point right. cloud of the building would, would change right. that. So so there is one question and I'll, I'll read it just thinking that we, this may be on YouTube later and we may not see the chat, but uh, Carson asked a great question through the chat. And he's, he said, you talked about how your research led to topics you did not expect such as the muddy roads in Britain or the Chopin shoes in Venice. Uh, what are some other topics you ended up learning about in your research that you did not expect to find? Huh. Uh, maybe in the context of students who are doing research and using research to learn new things. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I mean, and that is one of the joys of doing this kind of work. For me, it's just, you know, this has been a kind of a process of uncovering, you know, kind of 
coming into contact with material that I had never thought about, right, in terms of building, right, that, you know, I had studied buildings and architecture for a long time, and I was astonished at when I began to realize how little I knew about these buildings when I was thinking, you know, about the senses. It changed my whole, um, you know, sort of the, 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 it just opened up a whole new kind of a way of, of thinking about the environment. And, um, and so I'm delighted there's like the, you know, the environmental psychologists, you know, can speak to us more about, you know, the affordances and the way that environments offer us these opportunities to engage, right? I mean, this kind of interaction um, has really been, you know, exciting for me. But um, I don't know, I think the, the chapter, I did write a chapter on health and sickness and that was really something that I had been you know I, I guess because in terms of another kind of theme that seems to be kind of an undercurrent in, in the design of the environment right thinking about how environments and I guess this is something that also seems very sort of much in terms of you know our sort of current thinking with COVID and the way that you know the environment we how we have to structure the environments in order to encourage certain kinds of interactions between people that are uh, you know that are that are not going to be um, you know that will make people sick right that people will be able to thrive even given the kind of challenges that that I mean I don't know these are I have a student all my students are really interested in these questions right now I think it's really exciting for you know as a you know tragic in some way that COVID had to bring this but it's like the the idea that um, you know we can how the environment becomes even more how how the 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 buildings that we live in have become even more present to us in this in this moment uh, and you know more kind of we're thinking about these things more and the way that society is shaped by building um, and so this question about health um, which is of course something that Vitruvius was really interested in and you know the kind of Hippocrates and I mean these ancient texts that we have which are all about um, you know how building can make the environment better right how we can use building to improve the uh, the physical world that we find and how that is uh, that's something that I've really it's been resonating for me also in terms of thinking about, I just taught a course on the, um, a, a new course on kind of the environmental humanities. And so how this was, uh, you know, so much people kind of condemning um, urban growth and how this, you know, the expansion of, of cities and the destruction that's caused right by the kind of sprawl and, you know, the expansion of the built environment against the natural world and how these are intention. And that, Kind of question about um, you know how we improve the the world through building that that has really been a kind of inspiring thing for me and looking at the examples um, you know this I was looking at historical examples but thinking about how um, I was really interested in I looked at some at, at examples of actually Ottoman hospitals um, which were I, I thought it was fascinating to compare them to. You know, I was looking at a um, an Italian hospital, the um, Ospedale Maggiore in Milan, which is a very famous kind of and very you know sort of Renaissance kind of design of this kind of uh, rectilinear uh, sort of series of courtyards with these long you know corridors that became a model for European hospitals uh, really up through the beginning of the 20th century. But um, looking at the Ottoman examples was really fascinating because those designs were kind of the inverse of what the Europeans were doing in the sense of making smaller spaces that were more intimate rather than these big echoing kind of cavernous halls. Um, smaller spaces that you can imagine um, were also the, the, the actual the design of the individual hospitals were each hospital was smaller, right? That they weren't these enormous kind of and disorienting in some ways kind of those regimented spaces that are uh, you know, perspectival spaces that actually are very hard to kind of re remember, orient yourself, remember which, like which act, angle, which, you know, which hall is which, because they all kind of look the same. The, the Ottoman hospitals were much smaller and organized around a central courtyard. So it was, um, so thinking about how those kinds of choices, um, which were also, and then thinking about all these, you know, interest in sensory experience, which, you know, they were very much interested in, 
music as a way to cure patients um, and, and the, the garden actually as a resource, you know, that is not just kind of an appendage, but it is in fact a place that was intended for the patients. And this was an example of a psychiatric hospital in Virne, which was amazing, right? In the 17th century, there was this hospital for patients who really, you know, um, didn't have any place to go and, you know, had, had kind of lost their capacity to, um, you know, they, they couldn't go anywhere else, but they, the, um, the Ottoman um, state provided these uh, settings that were kind of like a miniature paradise, like with fountains and with plants and enclosed and how an enclosure amplified the sensory experience, right? The warmth of the sun on a wall that allowed these plants to flourish, that allowed, you know, the, the enclosure, which allowed the sounds of this music and the sounds of the voices of these people who were, some of them were, you know, chanting and singing and, you know, they, I mean, according to the accounts that we have, but it just, it was, you know, anyway, that is a very long and roundabout way of answering this question, but there was, um, I think the question of um, how building uh, and, and the senses is really also about what trying to, you know, from the perspective of the designer, thinking about how those, the, all, the, all the senses, right, can really help us to create those kinds of opportunities for interaction that can be healthy, right, that can be curative even, right, um, in many different ways. And so that was a, that was a kind of, an, you know, angle that I hadn't explored at all, that was, you know, anyway, became a kind of a chapter. Oh, it's really, these are some great topics, um, and I'm, I, I think the conversation will continue. I think uh, we had hoped that you would join us in person, and I know we're never supposed to reference what actually is happening, but we're in the midst of a big snowstorm. So I, I guess I'll extend the invitation, and we'll hope to get you out to Detroit at some point soon, and we might be able to continue this. I'd be delighted. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been All really right. a pleasure. It's, it's great to see you again, and hopefully we can catch up in person again. For sure. For sure. Thank you thank, again, Carl. Thank you. Thank all. you so much, David. It's great to see you. Thanks. Great to all see right. you. Too. <laughs> Good night. Bye-bye.